All right, good morning, everyone. Before I get started and introduce today's speaker, I'd just like to give a shout out to everyone that was involved and everyone that came out to Pirates of Penzance this weekend. It was. Yeah. Uh, it was really great. I, involved, I just love being a part of it. So just thank you to everyone that was involved. Um, okay. Dr. Roderick Caesar is the senior pastor of Bethel Gospel Tabernacle in Jamaica, New York. His parents, Bishop Roderick and Gertrude Caesar, founded Bethel in 1935, and the church has been thriving and serving the community ever since. Bishop Caesar received an undergraduate and graduate degrees from Northgate Bible College, Logos Bible College, as well as a formal theological education at Zion and Bethel Bible Institutes. For 10 years, he served as pastor of Calvary Full Gospel Church in Woodside, Queens, before coming to Bethel Gospel Tabernacle and pastoring alongside his father for seven years. In 1984, Bishop Caesar Sr. appointed him senior pastor of the church, and 10 years later, he was consecrated bishop, becoming overseer of Bethel Gospel Tabernacle Fellowship International. Bishop Caesar is also active on the boards of key Christian organizations such as Bethel Bible Institute, Logos Bible College, and King's College, just to name a few. Bethel Gospel Tabernacle is a growing church of 2,000 members with branch churches throughout New York, Georgia, Jamaica, and also Haiti. Bishop Caesar thanks God for his leadership roles and looks forward to sharing with you all today. Now that's just the formal stuff that I'm supposed to tell you. Uh, now the inside scoop, right, is that this man is a true detective, like Sherlock Holmes. Uh, if he isn't reading a book, he's either watching some type of educational documentary on television, or talking to someone about the newest car or a piece of technology. If there's one thing I've learned from my father, it's that you can never stop learning. Read, research, and repeat still rings true in my mind. Or you can pay now or, or, pay, you can pay now or play later, or play now and pay later. These phrases like these have helped keep me on my toes throughout my college uh, career. Well, though we share the same name, I know you didn't come to hear me speak. So please join me in welcoming my father, Pastor Roderick Caesar. Thank you so much. Now that you have given me a, a brief accolade, I'd like you to give the Lord some thanks and praise for his goodness. You see, it's all about the Lord more than anything else. We are simply the vessels that he would use to articulate his truth to those who are willing to listen. But more than anything else, when we come to the house of the Lord, when we come to worship or when we gather for any godly purpose, the end result is that we would all see Jesus and that we would leave this place with a greater revelation of him and a greater purpose for which he has called us into existence. And as I saw my son stand here and as I heard him give the introduction, I, I thought of, now take it in context, don't, don't, don't jump me for this, but I was able to look upon him and say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Amen. I love my son dearly. I thank God for him. He was a miracle from birth, and I believe that the purpose that God has given him in life will be realized uh, after he graduates and finishes his education and comes back home. He's got uh, a, a, a tremendous ministry that is awaiting his input. We will work together hand uh, in hand for a few years, and then there will be the transition as he uh, increases and as I decrease and move into another facet of ministry. But I thank God for that and for this opportunity today. For the next few moments of time, I'd like to direct your attention to the uh, book of Jeremiah, the 29th chapter. And in Jeremiah 29, I want to read the 11th verse. And it says, For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. What a powerful piece of scripture. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day for the opportunity you've given us to come together to assemble in this place and to worship you. I pray now that these few words that will be presented will go into our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, and our will to be subject to yours in obedience. More than anything else, we want our lives to count for you in these closing days of time. Help us in this area so that we do not fail to realize and fulfill the purpose for which you have saved us and called us together. For this we give you thanks and praise, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. 
from the word uh, of our text that was read, uh, there, there are some questions that we usually ask ourselves in life from time to time. And one of those questions is, what is uh, my life all about? What is my purpose? <clears throat> Just a few years ago, uh, Rick Warren wrote a book, uh, The Purpose Driven Life, and everybody read the book, and uh, not everyone, but countless people read the book, and they began to do life with purpose seminars and all kinds of things to try to stimulate people to recognize the greater purpose behind life than to merely exist. Well, to some extent, this is a little bit of that, but then I, I want to dig a little deeper into our lives and into our hearts as individuals. I want you to know, first of all, that each and every one of us has to have a purpose in life. The Lord did not give us life simply so that we could exist. Existing is a, is a, is a very mundane uh, circumstance or situation that people find themselves in. There's something greater in life than existing, and that is purpose. And when we recognize that we have a purpose, the next important thing to do is to focus upon it. And there are too many of us today who know what our purpose or what our uh, means are to be in this life, but yet we procrastinate and we don't fulfill that which God has given us. But we have to have a purpose in life if we want to be successful. For some people that purpose might be changing bad habits in their lives because we know we cannot succeed if we continue to do things that are not productive in the life that we're living. But more than all of these things we have to have a greater purpose than the short term of simply changing bad habits and bad patterns within our lives. We must recognize the importance of placing Jesus Christ and the Lord as the center of our lives in everything that we do. And we have to follow the mandate of Scripture to acknowledge Him in all of our ways so that He can give direction to the paths of life that we live today. We don't meander. We don't drift. We have a purpose in life, and we need to know what that purpose is. And the beautiful thing is that we have partnership with God in this because it is His desire so that we would be able to live this life to fulfill that greater purpose that He has called us to. We are, we are to be, to be together, together with him and, and to accomplish his great purpose for each and for every one of our lives. If, if two men could turn a city upside down, what could we do here today if we went out with a great purpose to fulfill the mandate that God has given us in this life today? When we have a purpose, it is good to keep focusing on that purpose and work toward that purpose so that we will be able to achieve it. The problem with many of us is when we reach a certain plateau in life and when we've reached certain levels of success, we tend to think that we have arrived at our destination. We must, we must recognize, recognize that that is not the arrival at the ultimate destination. destination. It, is it is only a respite, respite along the way. There's, There's a greater a purpose for each and every one of us, and it's not going to be fulfilled in the short term of our lives. It is an ongoing process that the Lord uh, unfolds in our lives so that we can glorify Him and honor Him each day that we live this life. And because we all have a purpose in life, uh, we all must recognize the importance of focusing on that purpose so that God's glory will be revealed. You have a God-given purpose in your life. Do not become distracted and allow the cares of this world to take you off course or to derail you from that purpose. I've met so many people in life who, in their later years, look back on the life that they have lived and they realize the things that they missed along the way simply because they did not stay focused on their greater purpose. There are so many people who live their lives in the shadows of greatness, but they never achieve it because they've always taken a detour to the easy road. But the easy road is not the road of lasting fulfillment. <clears throat> it is not the road that enables you to know that you're doing that which the Lord gave you life to accomplish. We have to stay focused not only on our present, but we also have to stay focused upon our future. And we have to live today in full preparation for tomorrow. Because if we don't live today in preparation for tomorrow, when tomorrow comes, we won't know how to handle it because we will not have not made the necessary preparation to enter into tomorrow and fulfill what tomorrow has to offer each and every one of us. So if we are who we think we are today, we must recognize that who we are today is the result of our actions from yesterday. And who we will be tomorrow will be the result of our actions based upon today. So each day must be lived with a focus and with a determination that there's something greater than existence, and that is to do the will of God. And so many people, when they think of doing the will of God, they think that means they have to be called to the ministry to preach or to teach. But to do the will of God more than anything else is to live a life that glorifies Him and honors Him 24 hours a day and 365 days a year. No matter what your profession, no matter what your goal or ambition in life, if God cannot be glorified in it, then it is not the purpose for which God has given you life. He has given us talent, He's given us ability, He's given us opportunity, and all of this is to glorify Him. 
And if we're not to glorify God, then what is the purpose of life? Is it simply to eat, drink, and be merry? Is it simply to have a good time and to be able to say that we were the most popular people in the spheres of our influence? Or is it to say that our lives counted for Christ and that through the life that we lived, others who did not know him came into the realization that Jesus Christ is the person that they need in their lives as well. You see, we don't just drift as the days go by. We live a life that has a full and a definite purpose that God will be glorified in. Amen? Amen? The church I pastor gives me some feedback every now and then, so it helps me, keeps me on target. Amen. God didn't just call us to run a race. He called us to win the race. And the beautiful thing about the race we're running for the Lord is that all of us can win the prize. It's not just the first three across the line who get the gold, the, the bronze, and the silver, but it's all of us who can receive the prize. And the prize we're running for is not a material prize, nor is it some ethereal thing out in the cosmos that we don't understand. The prize that I'm running for is to hear the Lord say one day, well done. To know that I have done that which he called me to do and I've done it to the best of my ability and what I could not do, he did through me because I was a yielded vessel and in my surrender, he was able to accomplish those greater, greater purposes. purposes. And, and I, I trust, trust that you that will you recognize, recognize in life, in life today, today the, the most, most important thing is that God is, God is well pleased with the life, life that you're living. living. If, if you're, you're going, going to live, to live this purpose, purpose life, then you, then you also, also have, have to be excited, excited about it. Because, because excitement, excitement is, the, is, the, is the muscle, muscle for the soul. It's what it stimulates you in the morning. When, when you're, you're excited, excited about something, you put more into it than if you're just going, going through a routine. routine. And too, too many, many people, people in life accept the challenges of life as routine situations. Every Sunday morning when I get up at about 5 o'clock, I feel like going back to sleep. But I realize I have a purpose, I have a mission. So, so I, I get, get up, up and, and as, as I prepare, prepare myself for the day, I ask the Lord to energize me and to encourage me and to inspire me so that when I enter into the house of the Lord, I'm excited about the opportunity that God has given me to come to church. It's not 30 years of doing it, it's routine. I know how to do it, I can do it in my sleep. No, every day is a new day of challenge. And every day is a day that I accept the responsibility that God has given me to stand before his people and represent him. So that means in the morning, sometimes I don't feel like it, but when I get out of my car in the church parking lot and I start walking toward the church, I begin to sing to myself, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and give him thanks. And what this says to me is that worship and rejoicing and obeying God is a choice. It is not something we are just programmed to do and we have no other options. I could stay in bed and call one of my associate pastors and say, you preach today because I'm not coming to church. But if God is going to be glorified in my life, I've got to go because I have a mission. I have a charge to keep. I have a God to glorify. And in order for that to happen, I've got to be excited. And let me tell you this. The most exciting life you can live on this planet is a life that is lived to the glory and to the honor of God. Because every day you will face a challenge that tells you to compromise and to choose the paths of least resistance. But the paths of least resistance never lead you to a place of purpose and fulfillment. You've got to stay the course. You've got to be willing to suffer a little bit if you want to reign with him. I, I, I don't know what's happening in our world today when people want all the glory without the pain and the suffering. My father often said there are people who want a testimony like the Apostle Paul, but they don't want to pay the price that Paul paid. There's a tremendous price that is paid for excellence in ministry, and it's death to self. It's living to a greater purpose and understanding that God, when he gave you life, wanted you to use it for his glory. So you've got to be excited about that and enter in so that God is glorified in every good way. That means you have to have a winning attitude. When you look upon the circumstances and situations in life, you can't always see the negatives. You've got to see the positives. Accentuate the positives. I tell our congregation that your glass is always half full. That means there's room for more. If it's half empty, we become hoarders, and we hold on to what's left so that we don't lose it. But if you recognize there's room and capacity for more, you get excited about what God is getting ready to do. And we also recognize the importance of speaking life. When you're excited about life, then even negative situations become opportunities for greatness rather than opportunities to fail. You can see in life as you live it that uh, uh, when, when you, you make, make a mistake, mistake, a mistake, I say to those, can be either a stumbling block or a stepping stone. It can cause you to continue to miss your purpose, or you can stand upon the mistake of yesterday, having learned the lesson, so that you can reach out to the next level that God has in store for you. And it's exciting when you learn life lessons that you can apply all along the way. 
When you don't get excited about what you're doing, then you don't uh, uh, really put your strength and your all into it to accomplish what God has for you to accomplish. So you've got to be excited. You're standing on the, uh, on the edge of uh, some tremendous opportunities. Uh, you're, you're in an educational setting where you can learn. Take advantage of it. Don't wait until you get out of school to realize how important education was. Realize it while you're learning. And then also recognize the importance of being, as my son said, a lifetime learner. When you close the book and you decide there's nothing else for you to learn, you've really stopped living. You just exist. In life, every single day, there's something you can learn. You can learn from anything and from anyone. And as a lifetime learner, as you fuel your mind, you give yourself more resources from which to expound and to share and to live so that those who look upon you will see the purpose for which your life has been given. Success means that you accomplish your purpose. To be successful does not mean you have your big house, your big car, and a lot of money. It does not mean that you have power and influence. To be successful means I did the will of God. And there are too many of us who deem success in the material realm. I'm successful because I have my Benz, my Beamer. I'm successful because I live on the North Shore. I have an in-ground swimming pool and a tennis court in my backyard. I'm, I'm successful because I have the corner office with two views and the key to the executive washroom. In fact, I built the building. We're successful because we have all of these accoutrements. But the end result is we're still miserable, still on the merry-go-round, reaching for the brass ring, trying to find something else that satisfies. The real purpose in life, the real accomplishment in life is to know that you've done that which God gave you life to accomplish. And when you're in the will of God, there's a peace that comes to you that you can't find anywhere else. The scripture says the peace of God that passes all understanding guards your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So that means even in the midst of confusion, you can be at peace. And the peace you find in the midst of confusion is knowing that your purpose is being fulfilled, God is being glorified, and your steps have been ordered by the Lord. So we don't look at things negative as if they are going to impact us in the same way it impacts the rest of the people. Now, it doesn't mean we, 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 we don't experience them, but it means that our attitude in the midst of it is of such that, that it's, it's an, an opportunity, opportunity for us to shine for the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. So, so we, have we have to be excited about, about what we're doing for him so that he gets the glory and the honor in the end. end. We, we have, have to, to know, know ourselves and be ourselves. If, if you're, you're going, going to fulfill your purpose, you can't be somebody else. else. You, can't you can't live your life in the shadow of someone you consider great and try to emulate them and be just like them. When I go out looking for music, why should I get a record or a CD? See, a record, I told them I'm from the past. Why, Why should, should I go, I go out and, and get, get a CD, CD from, from someone, someone who sounds, sounds like the artist I like? Why don't, Why don't I go and get, get the original? original. And, too and too many, many of us are settling for sounds like and looks like rather than the original, original genuine, genuine article. article. We, we need, need to, to be, be the persons person that God, God intended, intended for us to be. be. Now, now we, we can, can admire people, but we don't have to imitate them. We can like certain qualities that people manifest, but we don't have to try to be just like them, a cookie-cutter representation of who they are. We can be our own person, borrow from those around us the good qualities that we appreciate, resist those things that are negative that we see in other people, and become the person that God would have us to be. But we've got to be ourselves, because people who know themselves are people who have a sense of destiny. I know, I know why I was born. born. I, I know, know what I'm doing, and, and I, know I know what I am supposed to accomplish. I don't hope I know. I know. I know. And the, the reason, reason I know it is because I have spent time in the presence of God so that he can speak to me, so that he can clarify to me the issues that he has for my life, and so that he can equip me as I submit to his authority to prepare for that, and then as I launch out, I understand and I recognize that my success is not predicated upon me exclusively because the word of God says unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. So it means that what I do is I give him a full palette to work with. And then he takes that palette and he uses it to create what he desires to come from my life. There are two kinds of weakness that we find in life today that cause people not to be themselves. Number one, the weakness of, uh, in the area of skill and ability. But we can overcome that weakness by studying. And secondly, the weakness of attitude or discipline. And that can also be uh, adjudicated when we're willing to surrender our will to the will of God so that he is glorified in every way. So don't try to be somebody else. Be the best you can. A bad copy is no good and a good copy is no good. Be a designer original. 
Be the unique individual God created you to be with the gifts, talents that he has given to you and offer them them to him as a sacrifice so that he can take them and make them what he would have them to be. When we have the right level of excitement in the life that we're living, we can't be stopped. I'm constantly reminded of Joseph, and I think that Joseph is an example of one who had an excellent spirit. His brethren sold him into slavery. He became a servant in Potiphar's house. And instead of lamenting about his situation, he did excellently to the extent that he was elevated to be second to Potiphar in his own home. When Potiphar's wife tried to set him up and cause him to fail and to fall into sin, he resisted her. He was cast into prison because she told a lie upon him, but he didn't sit in prison and lament about his situation. What he did was he became the best prisoner in the jail. And because he was the best prisoner in the jail, ultimately he became second to the warden himself. Now you see, when God's purpose is being unfolded in your life, it doesn't mean that every street you walk down will be easy street. You're going to walk down some rough paths. You're going to be forgotten. You're going to be ignored. You're going to be used and abused by people who think they're getting over because they're taking the talent and gift that you have and using it for themselves. But ultimately, the purpose of God in taking Joseph from his home through these uh, processes was to bring him to the courts of Pharaoh so that when Pharaoh had a dream and needed interpretation, Joseph could interpret the dream and sit next to Pharaoh so that when the famine came into the land, there would be one there who would be looking after the people of God to provide for them in their hour of need. So you don't know what the end result many times will be, but you know this, the God who has brought you this far can take you all the way. He doesn't bring you to a place in life to leave you destitute. He brings you to a a place in life where you can show forth his love, his kindness, his goodness, his grace, and his mercy so that people who don't know him will come to know him through you and through your life experiences. So you have to maximize your potential. And you can maximize your potential by having an excellent spirit. And that excellent spirit testifies to everybody. You know that you have a life that is being lived with a purpose. Now, what you really have to do is, as I prepare to conclude, recognize that God has given you an opportunity to make a difference. Every one of us here can make a difference. Now, the difference we make will be predicated upon where God has placed us. There are some people who will have an opportunity to manifest that difference in the lives of countless individuals as they stand in a place where God will put them so that they can be his representative or his spokesperson. But even if you might consider yourself to be one who will be consigned to a a corner of life somewhere, obscure by the uh, view of many people, it does not mean that your purpose in life is any less important than that of the one who has the audience or the the great command of people to speak to. Because what God judges is not the size of the audience, but the sincerity and the integrity of the work that comes from the individual. We are statistical. We like bigger and better. We, we, we live in a world where a success is determined by size and numbers. We, we, we constantly uh, recap to people around us how grand the occasion was. It's like the guy who goes fishing and the fish was this big, but by the time he's told the story 10 times, the, the fish has grown because he wants everyone to see him as the great fisherman. Well, we, we keep it real. We tell the truth. We stay where God has planted us. We don't become covetous of being where we're not supposed to be because if we are desirous of being where God has not placed us, then we go on our own strength. But when when we we are are where where God God wants us to be and we step out to do what God has has called us to do, we have the guarantee of success. Because Because if God God is with us, us, then he has has predestined us to succeed at what we've been called to do, and failure is not a part of the equation. Failure comes when we step out of our purpose and we do it in our strength, in our power, and in our might. But as long as we do what God has called us to do, we will be successful every step of the way. Let me close with this thought. Some years ago, my father was being interviewed on a national television broadcast about his ministry. He'd been in ministry 40 some odd years, maybe 50 years. I'm bad with numbers. But he'd been in ministry quite a bit of time. And the interviewer said to him, well, Bishop Caesar, tell me, how is it that you have succeeded and uh, survived the mistakes that you've made in life? Uh, uh, I'm sure you've made many mistakes. How did you overcome your mistakes? And he looked at the gentleman and said, well, son, I haven't made many mistakes in life. And the fellow said, well, please tell us what is the secret of your success? And then they went to a commercial. You know, that way they had to make sure all the audience on the radio, television rather, would tune in to hear why he didn't make many mistakes. So they came back and he recapped the question. I'm speaking with Bishop Caesar and I asked him about how he's dealt with the mistakes in life. And he said he hasn't made many mistakes. So he's going to tell us now the secret of his success. So he looked at the young man and he said, son, 
There's no secret to it. He said, the reason I have not made many mistakes is because before I do anything, I seek the counsel of God. And he said, when I know that God has given me a green light, that is what I attempt to do. And because I have the permission of the Lord and the, the power of God to go with me, I do not fail. He said, my failures have come upon me when I have chosen to do things without seeking God's counsel. But I've learned to acknowledge him in all my ways so that he can direct my paths. And that is the simplicity of the answer. If we seek the counsel of God in everything that we do, and if we have the seal of God's approval upon our lives, we will have a life that is filled with purpose, filled with direction, and filled with accomplishment, and it will always be to God be the glory. I close again. I have three conclusions to my messages usually. <laughs> always make sure that when you succeed, you give the credit to who deserves it. And the, the credit for your success will never be because you went to Gordon. It won't be because you went on to other schools of higher learning. It won't be because you were placed in the right situation with the right opportunity. The reason you succeeded is because God kept his hand upon your life. It's because the Lord ordered your steps. It will be because God empowered you to succeed. And for that reason, when the credit comes to you, the glory goes to him. People say you did well and you say, God, thank you. People tell you what a great person you are and you can only say, I'm only great because I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus, the Nazarene, and I wonder how he could love me, a sinner, condemned and unclean. Oh, how wonderful. Oh, how marvelous is my Savior's love to me. When we love him like he loves us, we become invincible. When we love him like he loves us, we can accomplish everything that he has called us to do. It may be difficult, but it will never be impossible. I'll give you a fourth conclusion. <laughs> if it's impossible and you succeed, it's all because of him. There are times when he will put us in impossible situations where we cannot do it, so that when we do it, we can't take the credit. We'll have to say, God did it, and I give him thanks and I give him praise. Please don't drift, don't exist. Find your purpose, fulfill it, glorify God, and in doing that, countless people will give you thanks as you give God thanks. God bless you and thank you for this opportunity.